สวัสดีค่ะมาพบกันนะคะในวันที่2แล้วนะคะวันนี้คือวันสุดท้ายแล้วนะคะของงาน Master Class ด้วยคุณยาสมินนะคะโดยเมื่อวานนี้เนี่ยเราได้มีการทําเป็น Role Play นะคะสําหรับในแต่ละสายอาชีพเนาะที่น้องๆได้ได้ร่วมสนุกกันแล้วก็มีการทําเตรียมพอร์ตเกี่ยวกับเรื่องของ Super Curricula นะคะโดยในวันนี้หัวข้อใน2เซสชันในวันนี้ก็มีความน่าสนใจอีกเช่นเดียวกันนะคะโดยในเซสชันแรกจะเป็นในเรื่องของการ Introduction โรงเรียน OIC นะคะทั้งใน Oxford แล้วก็ Brighton นะคะแล้วส่วนอีกเซสชันหนึ่งเนี่ยคือการเตรียมตัวน้องๆที่อยู่ในช่วงเยก้าเป็นต้นไปนะคะว่าหลังจากนี้พาร์ทเวย์ของน้องๆจะเป็นยังไงบ้างแล้วก็เพื่อไม่ให้เสียเวลานะคะขอเรียนเชิญคุณยัสซินได้เลยค่ะขอบคุณค่ะฮัลโหลค่ะ Good afternoon to everybody I believe I've seen some of you yesterday Who was here yesterday Yourself Right And then at the back, and you, yeah, that's why I see familiar faces. Okay, fantastic, brilliant. Um, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, so today's session, uh, for those of you who came yesterday, there will be some elements of repet repetition. So my apologies in advance if you've already heard this. Um, but this is really just to give a general insight about the college, and also uh, a session afterwards we'll be talking about. How parents can help the children in their senior school as to prepare for university application. So the first session I'm going to be covering about OIC, just to give you general information about the college, Oxford International College in Oxford. The second session we'll be talking about Brighton. So we have a new campus that is being set up in Brighton, um, and then the third session, which I believe is quite a fundamental session as a, as for parents here, uh, how do you help your children? As you navigate through the university application process, how do you help them in senior school to meet the outcome at the end? You know, with the uh, university application. So those are the three sessions we'll be going through. Um, okay, a little bit about um, the college. So I'm the chief education officer at Oxford International College. Um, 2019 was the last year when standardized exams were taken. After 2019, over the last two years, because of the pandemic. There's been no exams, so there's been no league tables as such. So the last league table was in 2019. Of course, this year we may have a league table, even though this year is still the year with inflated results. Uh, but the last few years, uh, there's been no league table. So we were the only school that had above 90% A star to A grades. Um, I'm also the founder of Cardiff s i x o n College, which topped the league table in 2010. So I set up the school as a uh, in 2004. It became uh, that was a tuition center. So I started off with a, become as a tuition uh, center, and then it became a school in 2008. It then topped the league table in 2010, which is a very new phenomenon in the UK British education system. And then not only topped the league table, we maintained that position. Until 2019, until I joined OIC in 2017, and I took an unranked school and made that number one in just two years. Uh, that was in 2019. So the key message is that the reason for this success is because I have blend a pedagogical approach which has the East meets West approach. So I come from Malaysia, so I'm a neighbor, <laughs> right? Uh, so I did my SPM, which is equivalent to GCSE. I was a top student in my state. I went to uh, study A levels in the UK, and then I went on to do natural science at Cambridge. Um, I was supposed to come back. Home to Malaysia. Uh, my mother is actually here. She was very unhappy that I didn't come back home. I stayed in the UK, um, and then I went on uh, to. I was waiting for my research grant after I graduated, so I happened to be in Cardiff um, at that time, and I started tutoring from my home. I tutored chemistry, biology, maths, physics, and I was living in a very rough neighborhood. So children in that area. Was get they were getting a C D E grades, and it's a very British culture that you don't education wasn't a priority in that area, uh, at in in that particular area. Um, I remember my first student, uh, the parent came to see me and she said, "Yasmin, please don't worry, don't push my son. I'm happy with the C grade." <laughs> uh, so coming from Malaysia, that was a cultural shock because you know I remember my mother not talking to me for four weeks when I got a B grade. <laughs> so so this was a Complete different uh, atmosphere that I was under, but that boy 
uh, ended up getting A stars in his GCSE. So the word of mouth spread, uh, especially with children in that area getting such good results. So then I started having lots and lots of students coming to me and I couldn't say no. I just started my, I never had any intention to go into teaching, neither to set up a school. I had no intention. I was going to do research in science, in genetics. That was my kind of uh, area. Um, so I ended up having lots of students coming to me for tuition. Uh, these were students who were underperforming. They were getting C, D, E grades and then ended up getting uh, top results. Uh, and then it became a homeschool. Um, I had students who came to me for full education, students who want to go to top university, but they were not encouraged by their schools because maybe they were not top students. Uh, and then those students end up going to medicine, dentistry, veterinary, very competitive courses. So again, uh, it became a phenomenon at that time. Um, and then I set up the school in 2008, and then it topped the league table in 2010. So again, that was quite a big disruption in the education system in the UK, because traditional schools, which has 400 years of history, um, you know, they normally fluctuate in the uh, league table. You have one year St. Paul's girls, one year St. Paul's boys, one year Wickham Abbey, nobody maintains that position every year. And especially with a concept which is very new because it was a concept uh, of the best of the East and the best of the West, uh, com combining both style of education. So that's why we've achieved number one uh, consecutively since 2010 until now. Um, so this is a little bit about myself. Um, I g gave you my um, background that I come from. Um, so I teach chemistry and biology, but I take great pride in my university um, admissions. I consider myself as an academic strategist. What that means is that we do academic tracking and career tracking. I've spent my life um, trying to focus on career curriculum, because I believe career curriculum is really the essence of what education should be about, more than the academic results. For me, the academic results is just a byproduct of discovering your passion. So I have spent my life and my career in dealing with career curriculum. I work very closely with top universities in the UK, uh, also universities, top universities worldwide. I am an interview, I'm on the interview panel for a number of universities, um, and, and therefore I consider myself, as I said, academic strategist. Um, I won the Best Science Tutor of the Year Award in 2011. I received the award from David Cameron, who was the Prime Minister at the time. Uh, when I met him and he, he gave me the award, he said, congratulations, you are the first female ethnic from Wales to receive the award. I said, I'm sorry, sir, but I'm Malaysian. <laughs> so, so I was like, you cannot add me in your statistics. <laughs> so, so that was quite a defining moment. Um, I also won the Welsh Women of the Year Award for Education. I don't know why they gave me the award because I don't speak Welsh, but I am very honored to have that award. I, I also won the Class Nobel Educator of Distinction Award. This is given by the Nobel family, and I was a TEDx speaker in 2016. Um, as I said, I take great pride in university destinations. So over the last 10 years, my team and I, we have sent around 1,000 students to top universities. So around five, half of them have gone into G5 universities in the UK. So G5 is Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, LSC, UCL, and then the other half have gone into medical school. Now, the key thing here is that these students are international students. The bar for international students are, is far greater than home students. Home students, to get into top universities, because of the diversity, because of the, for example, in medicine, they don't have a cap, like international students have a cap. You know, the bar is so much greater for international students than it is for home students. So I take great pride that international students are getting these offers because we deal with constraints of time. When students come to me, I literally only have 10 months before they apply to university because if they come for sixth form, if they come for GCSE year 11, I have two years. But when they come for sixth form, 10 months, if you exclude the holidays, is literally 10 months. In 10 months, because of the constraints of time, we have to provide the best strategy for those students to get into top universities. We are doing something that other schools take five years to achieve because home students, they start this preparation from 11 plus. 
So those of you here who are younger, younger years, if you have younger children, please start the journey early. Don't leave it till they are um, kind of going into GCSEs or sixth form. Because in the UK, British students, they start from 11. There's six, seven plus exam, eight plus exam, 11 plus exam. Right. So they start earlier. So the, the earlier you can start this journey, the more the students will become professional students, because a student is not just about going to school and getting the grades. There's a lot of thinking skills involved. We want to educate students to be able to think, to be able to critically analyze, to be able to evaluate and have the right skills. Knowledge is important. But if you want to go to top university, they're looking at skills as well. So it's knowledge plus skills. Those two things are equally very, very important. Um, so this is, and also um, I help students to get into top universities worldwide, so not just the UK. Uh, we also have a smaller number of students who apply to the US every year, and they get into the Ivy League. Ivy League has band one, band two, band three. And this year, for example, all our students got into the band one Ivy League universities. So this is sort of just as an introduction. Now, before I go to the next slide, the next slide is talking about the changes in the university admissions system. Um, before I talk about OIC and what OIC offers, I think it's important for you to understand how do we prepare the students? What is it, the formula? What are the things that we do to strategize applications? Because if you have that insight and you have that awareness, it makes it easier for you to understand how OIC achieves. How do we achieve these fantastic results and get students into top university. So I think that's the first thing I'm going to concentrate on. Then I will talk about OIC. So first of all, I want to talk about COVID-19 changing everything about university application. Don't worry, we're not going to talk about COVID-19 itself. I think everybody has heard enough of COVID-19. Um, but I want to talk about the effects of COVID-19 and the effect it has on university application, which is why it's important um, for the children who are here today the, you know, whatever age group you're in, the younger you are, it's very important to understand this impact because it's going to have an impact on when you apply to university. So for parents here who can support their children, again, it, I think it's important for you to have this knowledge. Right, so the university application cycles at top universities in the UK, also in the US, in the Western countries has changed because of COVID-19, okay? Let's see why, let's see why first. Why, how did we get here? Right, 2019 was the last year where ex external standardized examinations take, took place, right? 2019 was the last year when exams happened. As we know, last two years, last three years, no exams, okay? Different countries are different. Some countries maybe have exams, some countries maybe not have exams. But generally speaking, in the UK, for example, there were no exams, right? Now, because in 2020, because of COVID, there was no schools, the government said for A-levels uh, and also for IB as well, the government said, we're going to apply algorithm. So the algorithm is based on the performance of the school for the last three years. So that algorithm will measure the student's results. So the school gives the results, then the algorithm will check the results and change it accordingly. What happened on results day in 2020, August 17, sorry, uh, yeah, August 13 on 2020, the results came out. When the results came out, the algorithm, 40% of the students' results was, was downgraded by, because of the algorithm. Now, the teachers, students, parents, I don't know whether you read the news, but teachers, parents, students, they basically were very unhappy because they're like, you know, 40% algorithm changed the results. It was unfair because they didn't take into account that different cohorts have different ability because you're basing it on three years of the previous cohorts, right? So then they had big, 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 big uh, disagreement on that. There was protests uh, outside the parliament and everything. So then the government did a U-turn. On 17th of August at four o'clock, the government announced Right, we are not going to use the algorithm. We will accept whatever uh, the results are. We will accept whatever the school gives us. The problem with that decision was that universities normally make more offers than places. So for example, if there are 100 seats, universities will make 300 offers, right, times three. Why do they make more offers? Because not everybody gets the grades and not everybody will choose that university. You can only go to one university, right? So not everybody will choose that university, not everybody will get the grades. But suddenly on the 17th of August at four o'clock, it's like stocks crashing, right? Uh, imagine a stock crash in a, in a company. Four o'clock on 17th of August, the universities were like, 
oh shoot, <laughs> right? we have to accept all these students because we make more offers than places and now we have to accept everybody. So that was the beginning of the problem because now they had more students and this only affected the top universities because all the students were getting the grades. So they were all going to top universities. So in the news, you probably have read, universities were giving money to students to defer their entry. They said, okay, don't come this year, come next year. We'll give you money. We'll give you free accommodation, free laptop. We'll give you cash, we'll give you whatever. Because the offer letter is a contractual binding. Unless you lied in your application or unless you did something that you weren't supposed to do, they cannot, they cannot rescind their offer. It's a contractual binding. So they have no choice. They have to accept all those students, right? So then, then in 2021, again, there were no exams. So this time the government said, forget algorithm, we're just gonna take teacher assessed grades. But the problem with teacher assessed grades was grade inflation. So because of that, universities became even more conservative. They make even more less offers than they used to pre pandemic, sometimes even make times one offer per place. And because remember the students also had to be deferred from one year to another year. So in 2021, again, they had to defer because they don't know what the grade inflation will be because it's relying on teacher assessed grades. They don't know whether it'll be 50%, 60%, 70% grade inflation. So what they did was they again had to defer the offer again until 2022. 2022 was the worst year ever in application cycle. This year, if you have any child that is studying year 13, you probably would have seen it's been absolutely difficult to get offers this year. Extremely difficult. You probably have heard that uh, from friends or families or children who are in year 13. In fact, in traditional boarding school, some children like head boy, head girl, you know, first time in their history, hundreds of years of history, did not get into Oxbridge did not get into G5 universities, first time in history. So it, it was a huge, this, this year was the most difficult year. The good news is this year is never, is not gonna affect you in that same sense. So the good news is that moving forward, it'll be better than 2022, but the bad news is it will never be as good as 2019. Right. So that is what you need to be aware of. It will never go back to 2019 because the behavior of the universities have changed. Right. Some universities have over subscription clause, which means that in the past they didn't have that in their contract. Now they have in their contract. I'm giving you the offer, but I'm also saying I have an over subscription clause, which means if I wanted to, I can tell you, you can't come to this college. I might have to defer your entry and all that. So the behavior has changed. Right. So that is something. And also their entrance, the admissions entrance that they require has changed as well. So there's a huge waiting on admission tests. There's huge waiting on interview. There's a huge waiting on, on these elements aside your academics. So that is the thing that to be aware of. So if I was to look at this year, 2019, 25.5% of all grades were A star. Yes. Can't see that oh, you can't see. Um, what can guys can i can't see the screen clearly do we have the printouts thank you for stopping that <laughs> krupa maybe we can give the printout because they can't see the screen okay cool should we turn the lights off or is that better? Yes. Is that better now? Yes. yes? Okay, fantastic, brilliant. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for stopping that, that's brilliant. Uh, 2019, 25.5% uh, of all grades was A star to A grades. 2020 was 38.5% of all grades was A star to A grades. 2021, almost 50% of all grades was A star to A grades. So you can imagine for universities, this is a big, big challenge, right? Because the grades are so inflated. And that is the biggest problem. That is why we got to the stage where now, so here, if you look at this, now pre-2020, uh, pre in 2019, uh, universities used to make times two, times four, times five offers per place pre-COVID. 
But in 2021, they only made times two or even just times one offer per place, right? So there's a huge, huge problem because of uh, great inflation. Now, the other problem was repetition and credibility because schools inflated the results. In fact, there was an article by the Sunday Times. If you look at this article, there's an article by Sunday Times that listed the schools that inflated the grades and they listed the schools. Basically, these are the schools name and shame, basically the schools that list that um, inflated the grades. Fortunately, OIC is not on that list. You can check the link and OIC is not on that list, which is great because we maintain that reputation. We maintain that credibility with the universities. And that is one of the reasons why in 2022, this year, despite being the most difficult year for university offers, it was phenomenal for us because we had fantastic university offers, which I'll share with you in a minute. But you can check this list. We're not on this list. In fact, my former school, uh, which I found that is number eight, which is really annoying uh, that they came on this list. Um, right. So what are the universities changing to? They are giving more weight to admission tests. They are giving more weight to interviews. Those two things, alongside with your super curricular activities, is as crucial as your academics. So your academics alone, even if you get five A stars, it is not a guarantee that you're going to get into top universities. You have to smash your admission test and you have to smash your interview. You have to smash, you have to provide a great, rich super curricular content. Because the, the more supercurricular you do, and you build skills based on your supercurricular, then you're able to become from a, just a good student to a wow factor student. The, the, the transition from a good student to a professional student to a wow student is what they're looking for. They're looking for students who eat, breathe, sleep their passion. That's what they're looking for. The academic is just a byproduct of that passion. Right. So they're looking for that passion. That is so crucial. That is the first thing that as parents, as students, that's the first thing you need to be doing. So that's what the universities are looking at. So how do you prepare for these changes? First of all, don't wait for the changes. Start early. Very, very important. Strategy, strategy, strategy. And the strategy is has to be personalized. So you have a formula. You have a formula that works. That formula has to be a personalized formula because if it's not personalized, you're not going to get into top university. It's not about, oh, Tom, Dick and Harry did this, so I have to do the same. I think as Asian parents, we like to do that. We're like, oh, so-and-so is doing that. Why aren't you doing this? So, you know, we like to do that. But actually, in terms of university application, it has to be personalized journey. So, for example, number of subjects you do, activities that you take part, everything has to be personalized. The more personalized it is, the more unique it is, and therefore they can narrate their story very well to the universities, right? So, I want to share with you university admissions. So, 2022, as I said to you, is the most difficult year of university entry, the most difficult year for the reasons I've already explained. We had 406 offers, 66 universities worldwide, uh, including G5, including Ivy League universities, including top universities in Asia. And we had 96 different degrees, medicine, law, engineering, philosophy, politics and economics, archaeology, anthropology, aeronautical engineering, mathematics, computer science. And can I please tell you, all these courses are below 10% acceptance rate, all these courses. If you want to go to Cambridge that has 50% acceptance rate, you should be doing classics. You know what is classics? Ancient Greek. Right. So if you have an interest in ancient Greek, then it's 50 percent acceptance rate. OK. Or theology, theology, religion, 50 percent acceptance rate. OK. But if you want to do these courses, less than 10 percent acceptance rate and medicine, 7.5 percent cap. Right. So you can see the barrier, you, you know, international students, you have two barriers, constraints of time, depending on when you start your journey. Right. If you start your journey at year 12, that you literally have one year. If you start your journey at year 11, you have two years compared to British students that start from 11. Right. There's huge difference in constraints of time. And the second one, the other constraint is the constraint of opportunities. Right. What opportunities you've had to build your skills, to build your um, to build your portfolio, your super curricular portfolio. That is very, very important. 
Okay, again, again, I want, just want to share this with you because, again, very phenomenal results this year. We had 75 G5 university offers. We had one in two get at least one G5 offer. We had one in three Cambridge Medicine, which is absolutely ridiculous uh, because it's medicine at Cambridge is very, very competitive. In fact, this year, they only had 10 spaces for international students, 10 new spaces. The rest were all deferred. And uh, we had four out of 10 got into Cambridge Medicine. So again, very, it's phenomenal results. Um, and then for Imperial, we had 59.26% compared to 12.28% nationwide, right? For non-medical subjects, this is for non-medical, for medicine, we had 23.8% compared to 12% nationwide. We had 50.75% to UCL for non-medicine and medicine, we had 9.1%. Again, comparing it to nationwide statistics in the most difficult year in a decade, in history, actually, uh, for university application. And the reason is, the reason why we are able to do this is because we stuck to the plan. You have to stick to the plan. That's very important. You have to have a plan and you stick to the plan. And that's strategy, strategy, strategy. The plan consists of three things discover your passion, build the evidence for your passion, and then you have to have a personalized strategy to present your case. You have to stick to the plan, that's very important. But you must understand what the plan is first of all and then stick to it like, like, you know, like it's your life basically, right? Um, now we had 63 offers to study medicine at 25 medical schools around the world, right? Again, you can see our medical offers. Um, more importantly, we also had students who had scholarships, full to partial scholarships at university. In fact, not only we had scholarships, we also had students who had scholarship for medicine. That is again, very, very rare for medicine, especially during COVID period, where finances is all over the place. Medicine is like the most expensive course at Cambridge, and yet she got full scholarship to study medicine. So again, we are breaking the odds, right? So when I first started my journey, we disrupted the model of what is a good school. And that's why we topped the league table. We disrupted the model of what is a good student, what is a good teacher, how is a good teaching, what is a good student. And then now we're disrupting the idea of, of uh, international students getting into top university and securing scholarships as well. So it's, it's, it's phenomenal. And then in 2021, which is also another very difficult year, but not as difficult as 2022, 55% of our students achieved straight A stars. Remember that this year there was no exams, but we didn't inflate our results because we didn't come in that list that I showed you earlier. So again, some of the universities that students went to um, in 2021. In 2020 and 2019, again, you can see our results. Uh, these were the years where there was exams. 2019 had exams. 100% medical school rate, 100% Russell Group University success rate, 75% had A star, AA or better, 60% progressed to Cambridge, Imperial, LSE, UCL, 25% Cambridge University success rate. And again, you can see in 2020 as well. In fact, I would, have, I would say that by 2022, our results have actually improved considering despite the fact that it's actually far more difficult, it's actually improved because we stick to the plan. That's very important. Right, now, what is the first thing that um, anyone should do in terms of their career curriculum? They really need to put themselves into one of the three career groups. These three career groups cover 98% of all courses at, uni at top universities. What are those three career groups? The first one, healthcare and biological sciences. So these are some of my students and uh, there are lots more students, but they just happen to be the most photogenic. So that's why they're on the slide. Uh, so healthcare and biological sciences. So that's the first career group. Um, the thing to take away from this slide, I, obviously you can see the results they obtain, but the thing to take away from the slide is that, can you see that the students have different uh, subjects? For example, she had three A stars, uh, three subjects. She went to UCL Medicine. She had four subjects, got into UCL Medicine. So everybody is doing different number of subjects. He's got three subjects, got into Cambridge Medicine, right? So this is why I'm saying personalized journey. Students have to do a personalized journey. The number of subjects depends on each person. Don't try to do what other people are doing. Uh, you can try. I, I, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Fine. Do you need to turn the light on? Is it? Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, right. So the point I'm trying to make is that um, students have different subjects, right? There are students with three subjects, four subjects, five subjects, and they're still getting into top universities. So this is why I'm saying it has to be personalized journey, right? So this is the first career group, healthcare, biological sciences. The second career group is physical science and mathematics. For, for this career group, for um, healthcare and biological is chemistry and biology. They're, this is basically the two subjects, which is very important for this career group. The second career group, physical science and mathematics, it's basically maths and physics and further maths, right? Because this is the career group for engineering, computer science, mathematics, physics, and so on. So this is the second career group. The third career group, this is the broadest career group, social science, humanities, and commerce. This one has law, economics, PPE, PPL, uh, land economy, economics, uh, mathematics and statistics, very, very broad, the broadest of all, right? This one, again, math is important. Believe it or not, even for law, math is important, all right? So this career group, so all career group, math is important. So really try to make sure you have a good foundation in maths. You like maths, hopefully, right? So maths is very, very important across all career groups. This is, should be good news for international students because international students tend to like maths more than, I know there's a stereotype, um, but it, it is true that international students like maths more than any other, uh, or Asian students in particular. So maths is key. So please make sure because maths cover all three career groups, okay? But what is it that you need to be doing? The first thing you should be doing is making sure that you try to establish which career group you belong to. That is the first thing you should be doing. So let's just get all the printout first. It's, it looks very thin. No, they didn't print all, but they were, it was performed with sent to all parents. And oh, family. okay. Yeah. Okay, maybe so you want to you want to tell that. Um, everyone, uh, we will send a copy of the slide to you, so we don't have to print all photos and all that, but we will send to everyone, okay? Thank you. So they, I think they didn't print everything, is it? They yeah, didn't print. the okay. one of the key the slides. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Um. Okay, so I think don't look at the printout first because it's it's not the same as what what uh, we're talking about here. So uh, the main thing here is um, what I'm where where I lost my train of thought here um, is to do with the subjects. It's very important. So your action plan for the students in this room and for parents is to help your children to identify which career group they need to fall into. That is the first step you should be doing. Are you going to be in the first career group, second career group, or third career group? Now, if your child cannot make up their mind, it's okay, as long as you eliminate. Because if you can eliminate, that will allow you to choose the right subjects. We'll talk about that more later on. So this is the first action point for all the parents and for the children here. You need to choose which career group. That's very important, right? Now, what do we do at OIC? First of all, we have what we offer is strategic global pathways. We help our students not just to apply to UK universities. We are, our students are applying to the US, applying to Asian universities, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore. They're applying to New Zealand, Australia, Ireland, uh, Europe. So we have what we call strategic global pathway. What that means is that all our students have an academic strategy tutor. The academic strategy tutor will help the students to maneuver through this whole journey, whichever university they want to apply to. Most of our students apply to more than two countries. You know, So we have students who apply to UK. I had a girl last year apply to UK, US, Hong Kong, Canada, right, okay? So, and she's also happened to be a student who wrote a book uh, that was published and she's selling on Amazon, right? So, so she applied to four four different uh, countries. You see, so that's what we help with. We help. We're not just UK focused. We are career focused, <laughs> right? So wherever which top university they can go to for their career, we're not UK focused, right? We obviously offer A levels. Um, a levels is a two year A level program or an eighteen month A level program. The two year A level program starts in September. The 18 month A level program starts in January. So you finish at the same time, but the 18 months is more intense. 
uh, the first six months is intense, and then you join the year 13 with the September students. But the first six months is intense for the 18 months program. Otherwise, it's a two year program or 18 months program. Now, in terms of A levels, Obviously, as you know, A-levels is like the key to get into top universities of IB as well. But the good thing about A-level is that you only have to do three or four subjects, which means you have time for supercurricular programs. If you're doing IB, you're doing seven subjects, you may not have time as much time for supercurricular. So, so that's the difference between IB and A-level. They're both very good curriculums, but you just have to choose based on time constraints. You know, A-level is more focused in the subject that you want to do. Um, now, in terms of subject choices, that's very important. Everything that you do from now on, whatever age you're in, is to lead to choosing the right subjects. That is the main thing, whatever you choose, whether you discover your passion, whether you eliminate your whichever elimination that you do in terms of your career focus, it's all about leading to the right subjects at A-level or even IB. So that's very important because you need to prepare for the subjects based on what your career choices are, what subjects you're good at, right? That's how you lead to the subjects that you want to do at A-level. Right. We also offer GCSEs. So we do a one year GCSE program. Students study up to eight subjects. Uh, they study maths, English and science and of course other combination as well. Unlike other schools which does one year GCSE, they only do five to six subjects, but we do eight subjects because our students are aiming for top universities. Right. What do you need to enter top university? This is a message I have for the students in this group today, your parents will always love you. Trust me, no matter which university you go to, your parents will always love you. Okay, no matter what they tell you, right? My mother always said to me, you have to go to top university. She always said to me, oh, why? you know, you have to go. I don't know whether she's outside. But she no. she always says to me, when I was studying, she was saying, you better I'm spending so much money, you better go to top university, you better aim high and stuff like that. But actually, she always loved me no matter which university I went to. Okay, so that is not the problem. The issue is, do you want this lifestyle choice? Is your choice, because this is a lifestyle choice, right? Uh, top universities is great in terms of uh, networking. It is great in terms of, um, you know, you look at Rishi Sunak, who could be the next prime minister of the UK. He met his billionaire wife in Stanford, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So you never know. Networking opportunities is always great at top universities. Um, the point is, is a lifestyle choice. Of course, the students at those universities work very hard, but they also play hard. They also have a good social life as well. The key thing is how you manage your time. So if you go to a top university, like Imperial, for example, you will be given one one piece of work every month to do okay for the same subject if you went to another university say Coventry you might be given one piece of work every term now the difference of that student that does one piece of work every term and the student that does one piece of work every month is two very different skill sets <laughs> right one could be parting all term and then submitting the work and then the other one, yeah, you have to party as well, but you got to work to submit, right? So you know how to balance your life, how to deal with those kind of pressures. That is a skill for a lifetime, right? That's what top universities does to you, right? Like I may have forgotten some of the modules I learned at university, but certainly the skills I've gained have lasted a lifetime right it's lasting me till today so that's a lifestyle choice okay so just trust me when you want to apply to top university please don't do it for your parents trust me your parents will always love you okay no matter which university you go to right they might say to you you have to go there but they'll still love you the point is you need to think about do you want this lifestyle choice and if you don't want this lifestyle choice what is the alternative ask yourself what is the alternative right and then you decide whether that's something you want Okay, what are top universities looking for? Right, as I said to you before, academic result is gonna get your foot in the door, but it's only one aspect of your application. You have to do well in admission tests. You have to show your personal statement and references, super curricular activities. You have to do well in interviews. All these three things are super curricular elements which you need to be able to present to the university. The more you can smash in this, the more likelihood you will get into top universities, okay? I'm just gonna share with you a quick story about this boy, Peldon, right? He, when he, he's from Malaysia. Um, when he first came, he was an average student from his school. Um, he wasn't a top student at OIC either. 
And I still remember his personal statement, his first draft of personal statement. He said, the first line, I've never been a top student, right? His first line. Don't worry, I didn't send his personal statement like that. We obviously changed it, right? But his first line on his personal statement, I've never been a top student. However, since coming to OIC, I have now discovered my passion. I really want to study computer science and all that. We obviously didn't submit that, but I still remember his first draft, how humble, how inspiration that he is showing his story, right? Now, this boy was applying to computer science. In the same year, we had another student, 11A star GCSE, top student from his country, right, in his school. He even won the best sixth form student in the UK. Brilliant student on paper, right? But they both applied to Trinity College. Trinity College is very competitive at Cambridge. They both applied. I remember having a conversation with Peldon, and I said to Peldon, you sure you want to apply to Trinity? You are competing against this other kid who is like 11 a style top student from the same school, right? And he's like, miss, what have I got to lose? I'm just going to apply. It's fine. I've got nothing to lose. So he's like, fine. You know, I've never been a top student. I've got nothing to lose. I'm just going to enjoy the process because I enjoy, I really want to study computer science. So I'm just going to enjoy the process and I want to be the best I can at computer science. So he went in there, he bloody smashed the, the admission test and he smashed the interview, right? And that is such an inspirational thing that he just went in there thinking, I've got nothing to lose. So I'm going to just give it my all, right? And he gave it and he did so well. He didn't get straight A stars either in his A levels, two A stars, two A's. But now this year he's graduating from Cambridge, right? So it just tells you that is not one size fits all. So for those of you who are now going into year 12, uh, if you were not a, the best student in your school, you can still turn it around if you have passion, if you have discovered your passion. The key thing for this young man is that he discovered his passion. That was the key thing. And that's why he smashed the admission test. That's why he smashed his interview. Another quick story, this girl, Esther from Hong Kong, when I met her parents, her parents said to me, I'm really sorry, but my girl is not very good in academics. I have never met Hong Kong parents who would say that about their children, <laughs> right? Right? especially if they're applying for a school like OIC. Like my girl is not very good in academics. She very focused a lot on sports and everything. She's not very good in academics. I'm not sure whether your school will take her on, but if you do, then let's see what happens, right? And, and they were very honest. They were very kind of thing about uh, the child. I met Esther. Esther was brilliant. She was like, she, she, she just didn't know what her passion is, but she was aiming high. She really knew that she wanted to do something. So she came to the college. She struggled in the first year. It wasn't easy for her because she always was very sporty and now she has to be very academic, but she had the sportsmanship mentality, you know, not to give up, not keep trying, being preserved. She had the right mentality. So she did very well. And then in the end, she chose to do psychology and lo and behold, she's in Cambridge studying uh, psychology. And I still remember texting her mother when, when she got uh, the offer, I was like, Look at this. Now, what do you say? Right. You know, and it's so good to see, so refreshing to see that students are able against the odds, against the typical student odds, they're able to get into top university. But again, you've got to stick to the plan uh, and the formula. Right. So how universities assess your application, your GCSE result is very important. Your AS results, if taken, is very important predicted grades, personal statement, interview admission test. So for parents and students here, if you're doing GCSEs, GCSEs are crucial, right? Please don't think, oh, GCSEs is just another exam, then I have to go to A-level, so A-level is the most important thing. No, because when you apply to university, you are applying in year 13. And when you apply in year 13, you have not got your A-level results. It's not like in Thailand or Malaysia where universities decide based on your final exam, right? But he, it doesn't work like that. They decided based on predicted grades, right? But predicted grade is not sufficient because predicted grade is not accurate. So they have to look at achieved results. So at the time when you apply, the only two achieved results you will have is your GCSE, achieved results and AS results if you have taken AS, if you go to a school like OIC, which does AS exams, right? So those are the only two achieved results. So you have to do well in those two exams to then get through. Otherwise, just relying on your predicted grades is not good enough.
right? So that's why those of you studying GCSE, please do the best you can in your GCSE because that's the first thing they will look at. Now, if we look at the timeline, for example, when you apply to university, so let's assume you apply in September uh, for A-levels, you sit your AS exams in June, you then uh, have your AS results in August, then you start your year 13, the following year, this should be 23, uh, October 2023, you apply to universities, November 2023, you sit for university admissions test. Uh, then December 2023, you have your interviews. That should be 2024. January to May 2024, you receive decisions. June 2024, you sit for A-level exams. August 2024, you receive A-level results. October, you start university. Happy days, right? Very easy, right? Okay. Now, here, this here, provided you're holding an offer, and you meet the conditions of your offer, that's how you start university. And also students who apply to universities, they can get rejected here, they can get rejected here, or they can get rejected here. So you can see, even if you have five A stars, you could still get rejected because you haven't smashed your admission test and you haven't smashed your interview or you haven't smashed your application. That means your super curricular portfolio. Right, so students can get rejected even before the A-level results have been announced. So you can see that academic is only one aspect of your application. It's an important aspect. If you don't get the grades, is you can't get through either. It's an important aspect, but it only gets your foot in the door. Then you have to show supercurricular, not extracurricular. For UK universities, supercurricular is key. Supercurricular is anything that shows your passion. We'll talk more about supercurricular, but because I'm a chemist and I love formulas, so this is formula number one. One plus two plus three. One plus two plus three gets you the offer. One plus two plus three plus four gets you to university. So one plus two plus three gets you the offer. One plus two plus three plus four gets you to university. I don't know whether you could see. Can we maybe turn the light off? Is it printed out? Yes, oh, that is printed out. Fantastic. Brilliant. So one plus two plus three gets you the offer. One plus two plus three plus four gets you to university because you have to meet the conditions of your offer. Right? I hope that this makes sense. This is a very important formula. This is like secret recipe. <laughs> right? right? Okay. You have to understand the ingredients of how to get this through. Now, this might sound, oh, this is just easy, admission test, interview, pre-offer matrix. No, there's so much ingredients that goes into this. It's like imagine you're cooking. You have so many different bits and pieces, right? This is just to give you an overall plan, but this is the formula. Now, you have to personalize this formula. So this formula applies for all courses at top university, but now your, your action point is to personalize it. That's key, right? Now, how do we do it at OIC? How do we get through this? Well, first of all, we have three pillars of success, an integrated curriculum, academic excellence, career preparation, and personal development. So let's talk about academic excellence. All these three pillars are very important. All these three pillars are extremely important. The first one, academic excellence. As you know, we topped the league tables. We had fantastic results. We have very passionate teachers, teachers who have come from top universities themselves. In fact, I think 90, almost 90% of our teachers have all come from Oxbridge or G5 universities. We even have a teacher who stud studied at Oxford and Cambridge. One of our maths teachers studied at both universities, right? We also have teachers. Uh, we have more teachers from Oxford, of course, very few from Cambridge. But then every time we have a bit of a banter between Oxford and Cambridge, I know, I think, you know, we have a bit of a rivalry, right? So the teachers that come from Cambridge always try to defend Cambridge, but we are out, outnumbered by the Oxford teachers. So, so most of our teachers come from there. But the key thing is not down to the teachers, actually. Of course, we have very passionate teachers and they work very hard for their students, but it's also because of the way we teach and we learn. OK, so our teaching and learning is based on these three concepts active recall, space repetition, retrieval learning. In fact, if you can start using this concept in your learning from today and you continue until university, you will find learning very, very easy and very productive, very efficient. That's the key thing. 
right? If you want to know more about active recall, space repetition, retrieval learning, you can see my YouTube. I have some YouTube videos on, on these active recall, space repetition, and retrieval learning. There are also many YouTube videos on this. This is, a neuro, this is uh, proven by neuroscience uh, in the 20th century, actually, that this is the best way of learning, okay? So active recall means you use questioning to learn right? Use questioning to learn every topic. That's number one. Number two, space repetition and retrieval learning is assessment. So basically, we have a system where every week we assess you. So we have assessments. And from that assessment, these are cumulative assessments. So from each week, the topics will uh, basically be cumulative. And the idea is that we have this retrieval learning and we do space repetition on a weekly basis, okay? They are called skits. So we have skits, weekly basis, then we have midterms, and then we have mocks. Now, our mission is not to, we're like a, we're like a doctor, okay, like a GP. Our mission is not to say to you, oh, you got 80% in the test, well done, brilliant, A, great. Of course, we want to congratulate you. But our mission is to understand why you lost the 20%. Is it due to lack of technique, lack of revision, lack of understanding? You should make it your problem to identify why you lost the marks, not to be happy with the A grade, right? Because it's not your final results. And learning is never going to stop, right? You go to university, you're going to be learning again. So don't be just happy with the A grades, right? Of course, pat your back and say, fantastic, I got an A grade, brilliant. But really, no, you, you got the A grade because of the boundary, not because you know every material. You got the A grade because of the grade boundaries, right? So if you got A grade and you got 80%, please try to identify why you lost 20%. Why? Is it due to lack of technique, lack of understanding, lack of revision? Right. That is what we try to do in our support classes. So we offer more contact time than other schools. So per subject, we do seven sessions per subject, seven hours. And within that seven hours per subject, we do more contact. Uh, we do support classes. So the support classes is to work on what are the areas that they didn't know. So we are interested in what you don't know, not what you know. And that should be the same for you as well, okay? So that's the academic side of things. Um, we also have, you know, if you compare us with traditional boarding schools, what they normally do is they have less contact time and then they have evenings where they do prep. Prep means they do their homework. We use evenings not to do prep. We use evenings to do career coaching, super curricular activities. So it's the same amount of time as a traditional boarding school, but we just change the formula. So instead of using the evenings for prep, because we don't do homework as much, because the homework is to revise for their assessment, we use the evening for career coaching. So it's exactly the same timing as traditional boarding schools, right? So that is how we achieve the academic results. Now, in terms of career preparation, this is the area that if I was to give one pillar more percentage, I would give this pillar, career preparation. So there are six strands. Strand one, beyond the syllabus. Strand two, programs, awards, competitions. Strand three, clubs and societies. Strand four, further personal development. Strand five and six, strategy, university strategy. So as for parents here whose children are whatever age you're at, um, you should start strand one to strand four. You don't have to wait until you come to OIC. You, you know, if you come to OIC, we're able to provide you even more platform, even a bigger platform, but I would suggest you to start now. Strand five and strand six is when you need specialists to help you, right? Because that's strategy. But strand one and four, start earlier, start sooner. Strand one, beyond the syllabus, programs, awards, competitions, clubs and societies, further personal development. We'll talk a little bit more later on. I have more information about this. There's also a brochure on super curricula. Um, do you have? Don't have that one. There's, there's a brochure uh, on the website. So if you want to go to the college website, there is a specific brochure on uh, super, oh, this one. No, it's not on there. All right. OK, so there is a brochure on the website which says um, uh, super curricula. Uh, please download that because that gives you a lot of detail on super curricula. Right. So that's that's very important. Um, then you've got personal development uh, examples of clubs and societies available at OIC. So you've got chemistry club, uh, gardening club, glee club, model United Nations, photography club, polydemia and all that. There are 30 above 30 clubs at OIC. Um, and most importantly, the clubs are divided into three sections, skill club, fun club, 
and academic clubs. So academic clubs are things like chemistry club, physics clubs, math clubs, skill clubs is like debating. And the third one, it will be like a fun club, like glee club, sports club, music club, and all that. So there are three types of clubs, right? We tell students to do at least one of each type of club, right? And if there was one club, I said this as a student yesterday, uh, do you guys remember if there was one club that you should all take part, what is that club? Debating, thank you, you still remember. Okay, good, for those of you who came yesterday. Debating is the best club you can be in ever because it teaches you how to think on your feet. That is the most important element to prepare for interviews, right? So it doesn't matter if you wanna, don't think debating is for lawyers, it's not. Debating is to be able to think on your feet. So join debating club. That's one club that all of you should take part in. Okay, it's a must, right? And you know, some children are very good debating with their parents, right? <laughs> very, very good with debating with the parents, right? You can be a lion and a lioness in front of your parents. Now try to be a lion and a lioness with the rest of the world. <laughs> right? That's the challenge, okay? Because trying to be a lion or lionesses with your parents is no point because your parents will either agree or disagree, right? It's never gonna go anywhere. But try to be a lion or lioness in front of other people that is a challenge that will give you skills for a lifetime okay right okay so that's going to be the action plan for the children now next time parents your your children debate with you tell them this <laughs> don't be a lion or lioness in front of me that's not a challenge okay right now super curricular enrichment program just to share with you some of the programs we do at oic um, we collaborate with universities, we collaborate with Imperial, UCL, Manchester, all the top universities, invited investment banker as a guest speaker, organized computer science program with Skillstruck, refugee camp project for all the students, creation theater, NHS youth forum. These are some of the enrichment programs that we do. By the way, every half term, we have enrichment programs. It's not compulsory. This includes work experience. Some of our students work in hospitals, JP Morgan, HSBC, law firms. Uh, they are not compulsory during half terms, but I have not had a student who haven't taken part in them. So every half term, October, February half term, they do work experience. The good news for parents, you don't have to pay extra for boarding, right? That's already inclusive in the fee. So they can stay during uh, Christmas and summer, they go back home but October, February, Easter, they stay. October, February, they have enrichment programs. In Easter, they do mocks before the exam because Easter is very close to exams, so they do mocks. So you don't, you don't have to arrange, like in traditional boarding school, they have to leave the college, they have to leave their boarding house, go somewhere else, you don't have to do any of that. They can stay in the accommodation, they have programs, basically. Um, you can also ask them to come home if you want to, but it's only one week half term. Uh, is, I think it's pointless. They might as well do enrichment <laughs> activities. Uh, and it's very good for their university application. Then you have super curricula. We have academic and non-academic competitions. Competitions are great. So all the students here, try to take part in competitions, please. There is one I would definitely recommend for you, Imperial College London Global Space Design Competition. Take part in competitions absolutely phenomenal because you know it's so important it doesn't matter whether you win or lose is the fight that counts okay so please take part in competitions so we have taken part in many competitions like one of the united nations math and science olympiad national school geology challenge essay competitions parli british parliamentary debating competitions and so on i tell you one thing i found uh, so good about my students and how they have developed personally I had a student recently, her name is Angela. She, um, she uh, sent me an email just before I was traveling to Thailand. And she joined, she found a competition, essay competition by Robinson College at Cambridge University. And they asked to fill up a form that needs to be signed by the teacher. So uh, because it's summer holidays and all the teachers are on holiday, she sent me the email, but I was traveling. So I missed that email. So when I got uh, uh, through it, I saw the email, if the deadline has already passed. So I immediately emailed her and say oh I hope this is all sorted and she said to me don't worry miss I contacted Robinson I told them I couldn't get hold of you and they said it was okay and I was so impressed by that you know she she pursued that and I mean if that is what we are doing as educators that to me is like 
you know, that is a skill that we have taught, we have really embraced her because she's passionate about it. She really wanted to commit to it. And I'm so proud to see that she's actually did that, you know, and I think that's, that's a skill itself that you don't get from textbook, you know, so I think that's brilliant that she went through. And actually, we contacted Robinson as well. And Robinson was like, okay, don't worry, we'll accept that, uh, that essay competition. And she's actually won many essay competitions. Um, Again, some more, some other ones that we've done, uh, volunteering work, student committee, raising, fundraising, and so on. They also set up um, uh, their own tuition center as well. Our students have set up a tuition center to help underprivileged children. So they're doing that as part of their voluntary work. So uh, I just want to share, so your pathway to university is unique to you. As I said, it has to be a personalized journey. Okay, let's look at the boarding facilities. So we have four boarding houses. Um, and three teaching sites, okay? The boarding house is absolutely brilliant. Alice House, you can see some of the pictures on the, on the prospectus. There's Alice House, Thames Street, Sudan Castle, and Wavy Gate, right? If you go on Google and check Sudan Castle, the rooms are beautiful. It's like amazing. So you can see some of the pictures here as well. So students have ensuite rooms, so single room. You can ask for twin if you want to. They are twin rooms, but it's ensuite rooms. You can also have studio rooms as well. Uh, meals are provided at three different um, places. So Thames Street, London Place, and uh, three ways, uh, three times a day, seven days a week. The only thing is uh, Sunday they do brunch. They don't do breakfast because nobody gets up uh, for breakfast on Sunday, so we do brunch instead. Um, so it is, it's it's uh, and and by the way, the chef, the chef who cooks for um, the college canteen is Thai. He's from Thailand, uh, and he run he ran his own Thai restaurant as well. So he closed the restaurant or he sold it, and then he came to work for uh, the college. So his team and him they run the restaurant, and he's uh, from Thailand, and he loves all the Thai students. I, I found out yesterday that there are some times he make mango sticky rice. Um, uh, so, so you'll be very happy. You will, you will have, you will have exactly the same. They, there's a lot of variety. They also have Western food as well and everything. But he's from Thai and Thailand, and um, uh, he, he has, and he's very good. He got his whole team. The whole team is from Thailand. So there you go. I have to say, I went to Eton once um, to give a seminar. And you know, Eton is like traditional years of history, people wearing long robes and everything. So I walked in there, I, w I was giving a seminar about interviews and everything. Oh, I, I attended the seminar there. Um, and then I went to, um, I went to the uh, canteen, the catering site. Um, and it was in amazing, obviously, you know, lots of history and things. But I was so disappointed. You know why? They only serve fish and chips with mushy peas. So after all that history, I get fish and chips with mushy peas. So that was <laughs> that was not very cool. Right. We also have uh, sports facilities. We uh, have access to Oxford University sports facilities. So see, these are some of the pictures. Life, life at Oxford International College. Uh, maybe we can turn off the light so that people can see better this one. So you can see some of the pictures um, of life at Oxford. So it's not all academics. They're doing competitions. They're taking part in seminars. They're doing debating. They're going to the beach for geography. Yeah, the geography is just an excuse. <laughs> going to the beach. Uh, they have sports day, right? And then some more you can see. What is this one? What is this on paintball? Arrow shooting. Halloween with the dinosaur. Oh, Halloween again, creation theater, they're doing drama. What is this one? Botanic garden. What is this one? Treasure hunt. Oh, during the induction week, treasure hunt. So, so there you go. It's not all work, work, work. There's life as well, right? But again, remember, it's a lifestyle choice, right? It's a lifestyle choice, right? And some more, sports, dining hall, the dining rooms, uh, boarding and sports facilities. We also have a very good welfare team because obviously we want to make sure that our kids are happy. Very important that our kids are happy. Um, so we have this welfare team, which is, gives a balance of yin and yang balance. Our welfare team has uh, welfare tutors. So basically all our students have academic strategy tutors, plus they will have welfare tutors as well. Uh, there's house parents and wardens. 
that live in the boarding houses. Some of our house parents are also teachers at the college as well. Uh, you know, so our like geography teacher, for example, he lives at the boarding house. So you have a very good team. Also, the other thing about the college is that unlike other schools, we don't really have layers that of approachability. So for example, you can approach the principal, you can approach, uh, you can approach me, I have WhatsApp, I have a WhatsApp with 217 students for the AS year, I have, uh, I have WhatsApp with the A2 students and the GCSE group. So we're very, very close knit. It's a small school, it's 350 students, All right? Um, and this is the house systems. We have Azura, Spies, Redox, Blackwells. So this is where the house, house competitions. I think so far Azura is winning, uh, but these are the four house systems. So we have house competitions like sports competitions and so on, right? Now, how do you apply? How do you apply? Well, the best people to speak to is Krupong and the team on uh, the admissions process on how to apply. Uh, but basically, we are looking at this. You submit your application, you send us your supporting documents, you sit an online reasoning test, you sit the test in your chosen subjects, um, or you submit your GCSE results, you have an interview, you receive your offer, you accept your offer by paying the deposit, and of course, you get your visa, and then welcome to OIC. We are looking for students who want to be pushed, who want to have this lifestyle choice, okay? That is key to us. Right, um, we are selective. We are about 150 students in AS, and we have around 500 applications for year 12 entry. Uh, also, GCSE, we have a very small group at Oxford. Fortunately, we also have another campus in Brighton, which is starting from next September. So, you also have an option to apply to Brighton as well. Same concept, same philosophy, same pedagogical approach, right? So, um, that gives you that. Now, you can contact our admission teams if you have any questions on on um, admissions right um yesterday i showed the students some examples of admission test i don't know which if any student in, who, who wasn't here yesterday but those of you who were here yesterday you showed you were given some examples of admission test what did you make out of it what did you feel about the admission test those of you who came yesterday it was hard it was hard okay um I gave you the good news and the bad news, right? The bad news was that that was level one. <laughs> but good news, everybody who applies to university, everybody who applies who starts always finds it difficult to start off with, okay? But they have training, they, have, they learn the admission test. I will just share with you some examples just very quickly. Uh, these are admission test questions. So you don't have to do it, don't worry, just to share with you, just to share the parents and the students who didn't come yesterday. If you look at a clock and the time is 9.45, what is the angle between the hour and the minute hands? So that's the type of question that they will ask, okay? You have constraints of time. You have to answer in 60 seconds, which makes it more difficult because you have time limitations. You have, it's accuracy and speed, both, accuracy and speed. Then you have another question, something like this. Did you answer well? All right. <laughs> Yeah, it's D. <laughs> I got it right. Okay, fantastic. Right, next question is more wordy. Two neighbors work for the same company and share the journey to work, driving alternately in strict rotation. They work Monday to Friday each week and every other Saturday. They always work the same Saturdays as each other. What is the maximum number of days either of them has to drive in the calendar month? You know, something like that. So these are the questions. There's multiple choice questions. There's open-ended questions. And then there are essay questions. So just to give you some awareness of questions, okay? Right, these are the admission test. Right, we'll just move on to interview questions. You also have interview questions like this, where it's more abstract question. I give you 100 pounds. You must offer part of it to someone. If they reject the offer, you get nothing. How much do you offer? All right, so those are the kind of like interview questions, okay? Or you could be given a graph like this and you have to summarize the graph. You have to explain what does the graph stands for. If we have time, I'm happy to go through this. Again, this is for history. They give you a map that is an old map or non-existent non map. Uh, what do you find interesting about it? When do you think the map was made? Where is it from? What is it showing? What message does it communicate? What does the name of the map suggest? How could this be relevant today? 
right? So again, not in your textbook. That's the key thing. It's beyond your syllabus. That's the key thing, right? So you've got to practice. So my first thing I would say to the students here, to the parents here, to help your children, please get them to read a book every month or an article or a journal. And then once they've read the book, write a blog. Write a blog. Write a blog over every book that they read or articles that they read. Honestly, if you can read books related to your career, if you can read books related to your career, it's even better, right? So you've got to read a book, read an article. It's actually a lot of fun because you're not reading to pass exam. You're reading to gain knowledge, right? That is actually fun, right? It's you're reading to gain knowledge, nothing to do with passing exams. So please start by reading a book or, or reading an article and writing a blog. Don't just read, write a blog after you've read. Okay, after you read. Write a blog means reflection. What did you read about? That's very important. Okay, um, I will be going through this later on, but I think I will just quickly, um, this is the competition I was suggesting for you to take part in, but I'm gonna just share with you about Brighton very quickly. Um, yeah. It's not turning. Oh, it's yeah, yeah. Okay. So I just want to share with you Brighton. This will take us like 10 minutes the most. So introducing OIC Brighton. Um, so it's opening in September 2023. Uh, so it's going to be for age 13 to 18. So places available from the age of 13. You're going to live and study uh, on campus. So it's very different from Oxford. So you're studying in campus. Um, you will be doing pre-GCSE, GCSE and A-level. So because it will start from year nine. Um, North Anglia's education, first UK new school. And we're accepting applications from September 2022. Has anyone ever been to Brighton? Have you ever been to Brighton? No? Brighton is by the beach. Uh, stony beach, but very nice beach. When I first visited the campus, I thought I was in a resort, <laughs> right? Because such nice air, clean air, and by the beach. Very, very beautiful, okay? Um, oh, I see Brighton students are resilient, ready for the world. Uh, let me just skip this part. This is about me. I already told you about me. Uh, this is our executive principal, Andrew Gillespie. He is uh, vice principal and academic director at Dover Brooks, uh, chairs of examiners at GCSE and A level for UK and international qualifications, uh, reporting uh, inspector for schools in the UK. He's also an author of numerous textbooks at GCSE A level and undergraduate level. All right, um, let me just skip all this. The program is the same as we talked about integrated curriculum. Uh, we talked about this. So this is the courses at OIC Brighton, year nine, year 10, year 11, year 12, and year 13, all right? And these are the subjects that we're offering. So year nine, English, maths, biology, chemistry, physics, history, geography, computer science, art, plus you can choose year 10, you can choose three from this, one year intensive, you can choose two from this. And then A level, we have the same subjects at Oxford. Right, so that's the, and then we're also gonna be offering design technology as well. Okay, so those are the subjects that are being offered at Brighton. Let me show you some pictures of Brighton. There you go. This is the campus for Brighton. Some more campus. So I normally tell students when they come to Oxford, don't expect Harry Potter, basically, <laughs> because in Oxford, we are city center, we're in Oxford, we focus on people, not the building. But here I will say you get Harry Potter. <laughs> So that's the uh, building. Very nice. Very, very nice. How many do 500. Capacity is for 500. Yeah, Five, up to 500. We're not going to have 500 from year one, but it will be over five years, then 500 students. Yeah. Um, yeah, over four to five years. Yeah. This is the phase one. 
multi-million pound, 80,000 square meter development. So uh, designed to create world-class campus with modern facilities, providing the perfect setting for students to thrive. 18th century building, 18th century building. So this is, this is the kind of the setting. Then you have phase two. Phase two will be uh, phase one, sorry. Phase one is uh, boarding for 240 students, 23 classrooms, including six labs, music room, drama room, common room, student cafe, dining hall, prayer room, medical center, gym, learning resource center, laundry facilities, well-being center, nature conservation area. Yeah, it will be like a campus-based. This will be head by its own principal. They'll have their own team. It's a separate team from Oxford, um, but it will be headed by uh, a principal and their team. The executive principal is Mr. Gillespie, right? Phase two, additional boarding, additional teaching space, more laboratories, communal hall, sports hall, fitness center. But there's already a sports center anyway in, from phase one. Then you got the rooms, perfect boarding experience. This is the artistic uh, drawings of the rooms. So you will have study bedrooms, bright modern houses, house parents, communal social areas, school nurse and medical center, laundry on site. I feel like I'm describing a hotel. <laughs> I'm from the academic background, so I don't do these things. <laughs> Laundry on site, school nurse, medical center, and then more artistic, more artistic pictures, the drawing. So that's going to be the common space. Again, common space there. Very nice. It's a multi-million pounds project. Well, actually not multi, more than multi-million. It's like around 30 million, if I'm not mistaken. Unbeatable location, that is where Brighton is. Yep, Brighton. So Brighton, London, Oxford. Actually, I would say Brighton is a better option. I know that some schools have opened schools in Oxford or Cambridge. But the problem is, especially for Cambridge, um, schools in Cambridge, you'll be penalized even more by Cambridge University because they will expect, the expectations are very different. So actually Brighton is a much better location for, for students who want to apply to top universities. Because sometimes universities, at the end of the day, you know, the world also revolves around contextualized information, the backgrounds you come from, the schools you go to. You know, are you, you know, what opportunities you've had? So the expectations changes. So, so this is kind of like, this is quite good, the fact that it's, uh, in, and Brighton is a nice city, nice place. Um, this is the city. The Brighton is a seaside city. There's a royal pavilion, direct trains to London. Very clean air. I like the air in Brighton. If you visit Brighton, you can go on the helicopter ride, it's very clear. I went there, I went on the helicopter ride, it's very clear, the, the areas are very clear. But it doesn't mean the kids will be going on the beach every day, just so parents don't get out <laughs> They're not going on the beach every day. The South Downs, oh yeah, this is what I'm saying. If you go on the helicopter ride, you can see this all, they're beautiful, beautiful. South Downs, chalk hills across the south of England, countryside setting. You know, it's a beautiful area. How to apply? Entry requirements are similar to Oxford. Uh, year 9 and Year 10 entrance. Again, we have the reasoning test, interview. You don't need to have IELTS because we'll do an online English test. But for Year 11 and 6th form, it's the same as Oxford. Yeah. And then this is the application process. Okay, so that is Brighton. So I've explained to you. So just as a summary before we have a break and I can move on to the next, the next part I'm going to share with you about supercurricular and how parents can help the children and what children need to do as well. It's slightly, so those of you who came yesterday, it's slightly different from, from yesterday's. 
uh, but most of it is repetitive, so uh, bear with me if you're going to carry on listening. Um, but this, I hope, the, the, I would like you to take five things from today's session, um, not just to apply to come to OIC. That's not, that's not my aim here. I, I would like you to consider five things for parents and students. Number one, please start the journey early. Don't wait until sixth form, until time to apply, don't wait. Start early. If possible, start tonight. Read a book, read an article, start tonight. Time is of essence. Time is money. Time. Your parents know this, time is money. They know this. They have the wisdom, they have the experience, time is money. For you, time is also money, right? Because it's your passion, your ambition. So number one, please start tonight. Don't wait, don't wait. What are you waiting for? Nobody will lay down the red carpet for you, right? So wait, continue, please start now. That's number one, I would like you to take from today's session. Number two, uh, it's very important to understand the challenges that you're gonna be facing because of COVID-19, because we're never gonna go back to pre-COVID. So you have to understand the level of competition has changed. So for that reason, you've got to compete and you have to compete well, right? You have to compete well, number two. Number three, please, in this process, discover your passion, very important. While you're discovering your passion, which means you have to identify which career group you want to get into. By identifying, you can eliminate. That's fine, you can eliminate, right? Uh, and that's, that's how you're gonna identify. Number four, please look at the supercurricular activities. Start writing like a list of things that you have done and then fig figuring out what you haven't done. What else can you do? Think about the time you've got. Those of you who have three years before you apply to university, plan what do you want to do in these three years? What are the activities you would like to do in these three years to build up your portfolio, right? If you have one year before you apply to university, then you need to really plan properly. If you have three years, plan. If you have four years, plan. Very important to have the plan. Number five, persevere with the plan. Don't give up with the plan. Stick with it and you will get through. So I hope those are the five things that you've taken away from today. No matter whether you apply to OIC or regardless of that, that doesn't matter. Those five plans are very important. Five things very, very crucial. Right, what I'm gonna do now, I'd like to give everybody a break and then we can then do, uh, the next session will be on super curricula and I will give more details about the activities that you can take part in. Also, I can share with you some activities you can do whilst you're in Thailand as well, okay? So I'm happy. So this is why it's slightly different from yesterday, okay? Cool. So I'll give a 15 minutes break. How long? Uh,